Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Um, good morning. I believe it's afternoon. Um, it's possibly. just afternoon now in Nigeria. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's good to have you. Um, my name is Ayatollah. It's probably the first time we are interfacing. Um, sort of physically, so to say. Um, so it's we're not live yet. So this is just like the back end. Um, for Zoom. Yeah. So we can transmit it now. It's gonna go live. It's just a sort of like a couple of um. I would say pointers, right? So essentially, someone else is supposed to join us somewhere in between. So it's okay. not going to be like a sort of conversation again between you and that person. So I've tried so much to avoid some of the things that could be gray areas. Um, it's quite political. So, but again, we, we <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, just to sort of give pointers, I, I'll be talking about um, what 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 does it mean, right? Like the entire youth enthusiasm, right? Again, so it's like two days ago, I next released. Uh, data on actual, um, you know, PVC collection, and we saw that it's about ninety-three million Nigerians. That's about six, seven million extra people as against what we had in the last election. But that, even when you compare twenty nineteen against twenty fifteen, there were about four, five million extra PVC collection. But again, voters turnout was still lesser than what we had in twenty fifteen. Yeah. Could that be anything substantial if you think about PVC collection itself and actual voters turnout? Again, we can't estimate. It's too early to estimate, right? We only have pockets of, even for us monitoring, we only have pockets of polling units here and, here and there. But do you think the youth enthusiasm might change things such that PVC collection might actually equal, you know, at least something almost substantial as well of, 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 of voters turnout? Um, so I think that's the first part I'll be going. So I'll leave that to you. Um, and I think also, Again, from the youth perspective, what should we be thinking about in terms of expectations, right? So, because it looks like the, the enthusiasm is high, at least maybe not with, compared to nothing I've seen before. Maybe 2015 might look alike, but I think it's quite different. Again, there's some sense of democratic dissatisfaction. And demo demographics as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, exactly. So these are the things I'll be talking about. Um, and I think the third thing is probably it's too early to predict. Could there be a runoff? You know, and if, if that's <laughs> yeah. yeah, what what could the political um I say what could the political atmosphere look like? You know, so I think those are the things I'll be talking on. So if if you're comfortable, I could just go live right now. Yeah, that's that's fine. That works. Okay, cool. Um, it's gonna go live. Uh, A quick one, how do I introduce you? I know your name, I know every other thing, but is that something important that I need to highlight? Um, yeah, Dr. Shankola is here. Um, there are so many different ways, but I think you can just say I'm an associate uh, researcher with the West African Think Tank. Yeah, okay. so okay. you can put a commentary under that. Okay, okay, okay. Um, thanks for that. I think I'll just, since we have Dr. Shankola here, I'll just do the pointers and predictors again, so we're all on the same page. Okay, um, all right. Um, Still connecting. Uh, sorry. Um, so what we have is Okay, um, sorry about that. I think uh, his call wasn't intended. So I'll, I'll just go ahead to live stream. He's going to join us anyways. Um, um, okay. Yeah, so just, just a sec.
Okay, yeah, we're live. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us again, our viewers. Um, my name is Ayatola. I bring you um, uh, Data Fight Elections commentary. Thank you for joining our morning session. If you watched it, if you haven't, you can still find it on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook channel, and as well as elections.datafight.com. Okay, so let's get to it. It's afternoon already. Um, in the morning, we previewed a couple of issues. We, we've talked about what the general voting atmosphere has been right so we've seen people it seems people are coming out uh we can't quite judge early until we have you know official statistics for the day but now we want to move into something quite quite different but slightly related as i have with me here um teniola tayo um she she's an associate researcher at the west african think tank and also a senior analyst with Alloynet Advisors. Uh, she has an MSc in uh, International Development from the London School of Economics. Uh, Teniola, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's nice yeah. to be here. Right, right. Um, so just, just to kind of say again, um, somewhere in the middle, we'll be having um, another excellent analyst join us uh, in person of Dr. Sean Koladi. But let me move to Teni now. Uh, Two days ago, I next released data on uh, you know PVC collection, and as we we know that that these are quite uh, interesting issues. There's on one hand uh, PVC registration, which shows you know political enthusiasm of the citizens, but then there's PVC collection, right? So if you look at how the stat is moving, you have more people you know registering, and then slightly lesser people collecting their PVCs. And at the end of the day, what really matters is you know voter turnout, right? So you have slightly fewer people again, you know, uh, you know coming out to vote. What do you make of this? You know, especially looking at the youth enthusiasm around the elections? I think those numbers or the difference in those numbers don't only reflect the interest of the people, but also um, the efficiency of the electoral body. Because yes, you had more people going to register, but I know that a number of people had issues collecting um, their PVC um, even after registration. And there's a situation for maybe people like myself that have been out of the country for, for quite a while and missed the, the slots for collecting PVCs. So there yeah. may be a number of things going on there. So it's not just about interest, but also about the trust in the efficiency of the system people tried and um, were unable to but of course uh, when it comes to the de democratic process we always have attrition at different levels so we'll see how much um, we have at the voting level right e excellent so 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 i guess my, my sense is then that if you if you there, there are a couple of issues right that would influence why people will collect their pvcs or not but then let's let's move to voter turnouts because my logic is that uh barring all these um several other factors that, you, that you've mentioned right the fact that people have their pvcs collected is actually very interesting um a few days ago data file released sort of an analysis of this right and you you find out that um you know percentage of collected pvcs as against registered voters is actually quite high even though the number is few lesser it's actually quite high you have some states having as much as 97 in Lagos, we saw, um, it, you know, as, as much as 90%. So, but then when it comes to voters turnout, it's quite a different picture. And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of put this in context, right? So last, the last election cycle, right, we had about 6 million extra PVCs collected as when compared to 2015, right? So that should ordinarily tell you you should have more people coming out to vote. But then you have the voter turnout is way lesser than what you had in 2015. What do you make of these dynamics? Why would that be the case? And uh, this morning I tweeted. Um, I mean, this is very, this is a very preliminary hypothesis. But I was thinking that maybe the readiness of INEC itself might be influencing this. You know, people are complaining that you know that some polling unit INEC wasn't there on time. Could could that be a factor in, in all of this? Absolutely. And when it comes to turnouts, I always remind people that we saw a surge in voters registration after the APC primaries. So it will be interesting to see to what extent that also leads to some sort of um, surge in, in actual voting. Um, and yes, a lot of factors affect voters turnouts. I was talking to some people yesterday and some of them were expressing concerns about um, violence. I mean, I was surprised to hear that because even though these elections have been quite violent um, in the precursor or to the elections, I wasn't sure that there was that much of an expectation for actual violence and we've seen some reports here and there although many of them um, unconfirmed and my worry is that if uh, incidents of violence are amplified on social media and you know some of them are sometimes not even real they could be old videos from other electoral cycles it can discourage some people from even going out to vote because I, I reckon that there may be some people that are watching to see how things go um, right. before they step out so yes there is that uh, concern but I guess at the end of the day we're all we are hoping for the best. 
Right. I, I mean, it's, it's, that's a very valid point. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Sean Kolade. Um, I'll come back to you in a bit. But again, just to stay on that um, for quite a while, um, Tenny, do you think maybe, and I, mean, I imagine this from, you know, the historical perspective, in 2015, a lot more people turned out, right? And then 2019, you know, the numbers went down because people felt it's the same, there's a light, there was a high chance of President Buhari winning anyway. So there's that incubancy factor, right? But 2015 was sort of a wave of change. People were tired with, with what was happening, you know, with, with Jonathan. Do you think maybe at the end of today, we'll be seeing very high numbers because of that sense of democratic dissatisfaction. It looks like people are tired of, um, you know, the current government. Do you think that we might be expecting, you know, high number of, of votes at the end yeah. of the day? I think, again, it's a very nuanced picture because people always refer to the energy and enthusiasm from social media. But um, when you go back and you check how many Nigerians or the percentage of Nigerians on Twitter, then you get an idea of what the social media um, energy really may translate to um, on, I mean, at the, at the polls in actual facts. But there's the reality, again, like you said, that when voters are not inspired by the candidates, they are less likely to turn up. I saw someone say that he was actually in the North um, some days ago and that there was some apathy there and which was very uh, surprising to hear because we know that the north uh, northern voters are usually more likely to show up to vote but then some reports from today are showing that they are still showing up to vote so again it's a nuanced picture and i think it's going to vary um by geographical region and even by also to some extent uh social class but there seems to be a lot of interest in going out to vote um so far as we can as we can see and as we can tell yeah well what do you think what do you think of the enthusiasm from a youth perspective especially in terms of political expectation do you, do you yeah. think yeah i mean well, this is two way right yeah yeah just, yeah, just, just, yeah. Yeah, you know, sometimes when we talk about the Nigerian youth, we I always remind people that when we talk about the Nigerian youth, we are often thinking about very specifically middle class um southern youth because they are the ones whose voices are usually um better heard. It's also Nigerian youth that are the majority of the bandits, so-called bandits, um in the northwest and the north central. They're also the ones that um Boko Haram is using um to to wreak havoc. So the Nigerian youth are very diverse. Um, they are also the ones that are, have been disenfranchised in in parts of the country where they don't have jobs, they don't have um, sources of livelihoods. So again, just a reminder that the people's sentiments that we're really recording or we're really seeing um, on social media is a very um, is, a, is a small part of the Nigerian youth. But there is no doubt that um, the candidacy of some of the different candidates have spread beyond social media. And they, But again, to remind ourselves that Nigerian youth are supporting uh, many different candidates. Uh, remember, even under the, the Tinubu as one of the candidates, I think his youth council uh, created something called the Jagaban army so it's a very nuanced picture again it's very important to not use one uh, uh, brush stroke to paint the the entire thing but i am personally encouraged by the amount of engagements that i have seen on my whatsapp everyone is posting about the elections i haven't seen anything like this before so i am very encouraged and i think they can only go up from here you know as long as elections are free and fair it's it's very important that they're transparent so that whatever happens people know that they, they you know they tried their best and it's at the end of the day it's whoever gets the most votes according to the constitution that will emerge the winner right right no no thanks thanks for that and i think you raised a very valid point that we would come back to later but let me just um, jump on um to dr shin kolade now um so talking about the youth expectation so I, I imagine like a very valid point perhaps one might be you know there's this sense of assertment bias here I, I, we as middle class youth might probably be sampling more between our social class right but again I, I don't want to imagine that this is substantially different everywhere you go because the polls have sort of you know pointed us in that direction um and I think from a scientific and data point of view which is what we're trying to do here they seem to be correct with some of the polls that I've seen um Dr. Shion, what, what do you make of the youth enthusiasm, the youth expectation? On one hand, in terms of how people would come out to vote, and on the other hand, how what what if things don't go their way? You know what would happen? I think Tanya said at the end of the day, democracy wins, right? But do you do you foresee anything you know magical in that sense happening if things don't go the youth way, so to say? Uh, well, I mean, so it, it's quite uh, not a very simple picture. I do agree, by the way, and, and good good uh, morning, good afternoon to you, Maximus and, and, and Tenny. Uh, it, uh, it's very interesting. I think we have seen a, a level of engagement uh, that we have not seen before in previous you know, election cycles. Of course, you are right in saying 
that when you have a president coming to the end of the second term or, or there's a prospect for change of uh, political parties, you tend to see uh, a higher level of engagement rather than, you know, when incumbent is uh, seeking for election. That happens everywhere, actually. It's not peculiar to Nigeria. But, but I think, but I think the, the level of engagement among the, the youth it's, uh, is something really fascinating, really interesting. And I think it's not just an isolated, you know, uh, development. I think is a is is a progressive combination, you know, of the kind of agitation that we have seen, kind of organized uh, uh, movement and agitation that we have seen, you know, from the beginning of NSAS protest. Actually, when you see, you know, young uh, young people, the youth uh, population rising up, you know, especially in the southern part of the country uh with one voice that you know this brutality has to stop and we we saw how that you know uh ended maybe ended is not the word how that was put down violently uh by the by agent of the nigerian government but what you see is that the spirit of that agitation uh, is very much alive you know i think it's a place of people coming to to a place that you know we cannot continue to moan and agonize and complain. We have to organize ourselves and make our voice count. You know, uh, and we don't have to resign ourselves to you know the to what is a tepid kind of offering in the current you know political arrangement where you have two dominant parties, for example, or the establishment just doing things as they like. You know, uh, I think for a long time you know we've had you know. A, a kind of a narrative that the middle class, especially, are uh, fond of complaining, uh, but they haven't got the time to organize and make their voices count. And that is why, you know, you sort of out, leave this space then to, to tout, you know, to hoodlums and so on. But I think the answers was an intimation of a new kind of movement. Mm -hmm. of youth coming together independent of political parties to organize themselves to actually make their voice count. So what we see, what we see in this cycle is a progression of that, uh, of that, you know, organization, of, the, of, the, of that development of youth actually believing, you know, that they can make things happen. Uh, mm -hmm. Whatever, you know, uh, uh, political party, you know, a, a affiliation, I think that is important. And I hear what Tenny is saying, that, uh, of course, it's a nuanced picture. You don't want to use social media narrative to paint a picture of youth, youth, bandit are youth. <laughs> of course, the, 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 the Boko Haram recruits, you know, are very much youth. They are the army of the seven child's uh, youth. But I think what is important, and I'll pause for a moment, what is important to recognize also about you know thought leadership about you know about uh, about leadership even among the youth demographic. Yeah. So when you have educated, conscious, politically conscious youth, mm -hmm. they do have influence beyond social media. Uh, whether or not you know we are able to measure it in very you know explicit terms because yeah. they are they are informed because they are educated. So whether in the northern part of the country or the southern part of the country. Those army of educated youth that you see on social media actually do wield influence. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is not wrong to actually use that as a gauge of what is happening, you know, uh, in the country uh, at large, of course, but with the nuances that, you know, there are still many that are outside of the radios of this influence who are, you know, uneducated, who are, you know, in the remote and rural areas. But I mean, but but the influence of the educated youth you see on social media cannot be be underestimated either, and I think that is why this is this is significant. You know what is happening, and we see, of course, what the numbers turn out to be. You know, uh, at the end of the day or by tomorrow, I suppose. Yeah. No. No. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. I think to just sort of buttress your point again. This is not to do some back and forth. You know, I like quite all right. You know when you see like pvc um registration data so the way it's it's divided is you have like age you know segmentation and you have gender segmentation as well but you also have one subtle important fact is occupation segmentation right and you see that at least 60 percent of new pvc collections are students so again so this tells me this sense of you know the the kind of voters i mean this obviously spreads to you know the voting population as well you know 
the kind of behavior which I expect from voters. These are, you know, knowledgeable, these are well-informed voters who, in a sense, you know, some of the ideologies that they esteem on social media might actually be translated, you know, offline at the polls. Um, so, so thanks for that. One question uh, which I've been quite avoiding, do you think there could be a runoff? And this is to both of you, um, either of you could go first. And what are the possibilities? What are the chances that that could happen? Because again, my sense is that it's a tough call. <laughs> it's a tough call. What, what do you think? Are you, you are, I think you are, we're talking about the presidential election now. Presidential elections, please, yeah, yes. I mean, I, I think, I think quite frankly, I think uh, a runoff is uh, is still unlike is unlikely. Uh, but if you were to ask me four years ago, I would say you know it is not going to happen. Uh, but I'm not going to go on a limb and say you know it's not going to happen. I would say it is unlikely, but it's possible. It can happen. Uh, because I think you've seen a mix of various, you know, variables at play in this election, as we have not seen before. Mm -hmm. There are those who are concerned about, you know, of course, the, uh, I mean, so you see, you know, factors of ethnicity and religion come into play as well, you know, not just youth, you know, angry uh, and all of that. And then you see a different kind of permutation with the, with the North Central, uh, of course, the South, South and Southeast as well. So I think it's likely that uh, uh, the candidates of the of of the two uh, leading previously leading parties will, will say, you know, my my struggle in some in some in some region than yeah. they would in previous election cycle. Right. Uh, so there is a possibility of, of a runoff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I mean, it is unlikely, but it's possible. That's what I would say. Right. Uh, Tenny, what do, you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's quite difficult to say at this point, really. I know a lot of polls have said that there's a possibility of a runoff, especially given that, um, according to the constitution, it's not just a simple majority that um, determines who wins the elections. So that's where the permutations, you know, may get a bit tricky. And that's where INEC also has to be very careful, you know, because um, we need a lot of transparency there. So it, it, it's, it's possible. You know, but again, for me, I think it's it's still too too early to tell. A lot depends on turnout, you know, um, per region and turnout per political support or per political strongholds um, across the different candidates. Uh, we have, I mean, usually it's between two people, like you said before, but now we have three people and even an additional one that is probably going to get um, a lot of votes from from places of a stronghold of some of the other candidates. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, but, but I think maybe one thing has to add to that, uh, Tene, is, I mean, I've, I've seen a few reports this morning about the logistics of, uh, of the exactly. of election itself. Yeah. So, I mean, in fact, just before I, I came on, on your show, uh, uh, there are places, you know, in Lagos, for example, where accredit uh, accreditation has not started. Yes. Uh, uh, there was a place, you know, a friend reporting from Abuja, saying that uh, the INEC officials came around 11 o'clock this morning and then they left because they said you know they were in a, diff in a wrong you know venue uh so and then they yeah. just waited for new officers you know to arrive yeah. so if this is happening in lagos and abuja you can then begin to imagine what is happening you know uh, across the i mean the interlands you know in the more uh, remote areas Mm -hmm. And I think this speaks again to the to the logistics, you know, of of, of, of election uh, of, of organization uh, in Nigeria. So and and so yeah. So you may find also that a, a lot a, a significant number of people may not be able to vote, even mm -hmm. though they want to. Because how long are you going to? I mean, some have been there. I understand some have been there at the polling booth as early as five thirty a.m. this morning. Right, and at the time they were reporting was around eleven thirty Nigerian time, and they have not done accreditation. So it's also about the process, how the process, maybe by design or by default, uh, mm -hmm. frustrates the electorate uh, yeah. who are how to exercise their franchise, but have to wait for you know six, seven hours or more. Right, uh, and and you may find you know that a number of citizens are not able to bear that, not least because of the current circumstances. I mean, there is you know orchestrated. Hardship, you know, uh, I, I can't put it in a better way. I'm not in <laughs> political here, 
yeah. uh, that uh, that makes that made life difficult. I mean, people don't have money; they don't have food. So, are you going to stand on the on the polling unit for seven hours? Right. So that may also actually affect, you know, uh, the 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 turnout in the end. Turnout, no, yeah, so, we, we discussed that at the beginning, that yeah. turnout also depends on INEX um, efficiency, you know, yeah. not just on the will of the people. Um, because apart from that, I even saw that there's a polling unit where INEX officials, they said they're on strike because they haven't been paid. Okay, so they're yeah. not going to work. Um, and of course, there's a report that some people's polling units were changed overnight. I don't know how true that is, but then they are finding that they cannot vote where they were supposed to vote. Then there have been attacks as well on some polling units um, here here and there so there's a lot uh, going on and you're absolutely right that you know a lot depends on INEC I, I, a lot really depends on INEC at this point and of course the security forces um to be as impartial as possible but then on INEC to be as efficient and as effective as possible um to not to disenfranchise uh willing voters yeah, yeah. But, and, and I think it also actually speaks to the wider issue of yeah. violations organized you know in Nigeria I mean, I know we don't want to go into all of that now because it's another <laughs> longer conversation. But in other places, you know, you could vote, you know, by by post. You know, you could send in your 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 ballot in the post. I mean, there are you know electronic uh, options and and so on. I mean, I know you know it's it's it's, it's challenging because then it opens up to a whole range of things, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of fraud and uh, all of that. But 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 I think there is something to be said, and I'm here uh, sitting on this desk in Wolverhampton. I'm a Nigerian citizen. Uh, full-blooded Nigerian citizen, I cannot vote. So, I mean, and there are, you know, millions like me, you know, out, outside Nigeria. So that is also something else, you know, in terms of uh, the, the electoral process uh, in the country. Right. No, no, th thanks thanks to you both for, for that. And I think you've really touched on a lot of things that are in, pe in people's minds, especially in terms of INEC readiness. I've seen people t tell me, you know, so I'm, I'm on, you know, different platforms sort of monitoring the elections by, by region, right? And this is happening in every region. It's not even peculiar to, let's say, the mega cities. It's happening even in the most, you know, unexpected places. You know, INEC officials are getting there late. Materials are not there. People are being accredited late. You know, those kind of things. And voting is supposed to end by two p.m. And of course, if you're if you're on, if you're in the queue, you get you, you are allowed to vote. But then the question is, how long can people endure this? So imagine someone who has to wait six hours before they vote. You know, and that sort of translates into something else, right? Which is you know, it's something hiding in plain sight. Do, do you think people would really be, you know, interested in wanting to, so to say, monitor their votes? Now I'm talking about, you know, um, polling units level now. So traditionally what we used to have is that we have INEC, you know, the presiding officer after the results are counted, you know, they paste the form E60B, is that how it's called? You know, the results of the actual election is posted at the, you know, polling units. But now we have IREV, right? So the results are being transmitted live. But when you have a situation where citizens have sort of been frustrated, you know, from the voting process and all of that, do you think people would demand accountability enough to want to know that uh, is it the actual results that's been uploaded live, for instance, or that's been posted at the, you know, at the polling units? Do you think that sort of enthusiasm can be sustained? Because this is obviously what INEC wants to achieve, you know, that's, you know, transparency, but it seems to be self-defeating now. This is to any of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Annie, do you want to go first? <laughs> okay, I can I can say that um the last couple of weeks in Nigeria have been very tough. Uh yeah, absolutely right about that. But I think also at this point, um being Nigerians living in Nigeria, we never expect things to be easy. So I'm also aware that a lot of people are going to their polling units expecting things to be tough, expecting things to be stressful. I saw a photo of some uh, so -called, some Gen Z where they had carried a tent to their polling units and then they had a mat. They you know they were very prepared um to be there for the long haul. So yes, people are tired, people are stressed out, but I don't think anyone expects it to be easy. I think a lot of people are going into this knowing that it's gonna be tough, and I think a lot of people are actually willing to dedicate today um to the I mean to, to this to these elections unless of course there's a threat of violence so we'll see how it plays out and I, at the end of this for just those that are interested in in staying back to monitor but yeah we, you know our threshold for stress now as Nigerians has has gone up so <laughs> I think some people are ready to just be there for the long haul mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I mean I, I I totally agree with that actually I think uh I mean yeah. There is a higher level of commitment. Uh, there's a higher level of consciousness. I think there's a, a very strong cohort of 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 of, of youth who 
feel that you know this is like a kind of a the last resort, the last chance, you know, to make change happen. And and they are they are committed to it. I mean, again, you know, I go back to to NSAS. You see, you know, uh, people standing there until live bullets started flowing. You know, uh, they were there. You know, they were they were. You know, and and I think you know there is a commitment to that. You know that if for anything, you know, uh, if people are going to wait and cast their vote. The one thing I think you can almost be sure about is that many of them want to wait around and see that posted life. Mm -hmm. uh, if if they are not, you know, committed enough to to wait for six seven hours, uh, then you might say, okay, maybe not. But as long as you have voted, I think you are going to see a higher, you know, level of commitment to say, okay, let's see it live before mm -hmm. I leave this place, and that's good. I think that's good. That can only be a good thing for the for the transparency of the process itself, for the credibility and, and the integrity of the process. Yeah. So yeah, I think you're going to see, uh, especially in the cities, you know, a lot of uh, yeah people waiting around to to see you know their votes, you know, posted live. Yeah. One one quick thing. Um, I don't know how well um, um you both have sort of been monitoring um the performance of technology in the election so far, but let's talk about it, right? Um, INEX seems to be getting it right this time. Um, at least for the most part, there are no serious complaints about beavers in most places, at least. The complaints has rather been on INEX staff coming late, election materials coming late, right? Uh, but, you know, we, we saw, we, we are seeing an improvement as against what happened in the, you know, for instance, the Abuja off-cycle election, where almost 60%, 70% of <laughs> beavers were, aren't working well. Do, 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 do you think INEC has been successful in the use of technology so far? I mean, so I I, I personally can speak with a, a great deal of authority on on the on the level of uh, uh, INEC uh, technology adoption. I can only speak as somebody who has researched and who is researching this area in terms of digital transformation, application of uh, digital technologies. In, in the public sector. In fact, I'm hosting a, a, a symposium soon on that. Uh, so I think, you know, you cannot, you know, uh, it's a win-win situation with technology. I mean, so uh, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm also doing some work around cybersecurity, you know, there's always the downside, there's a risk, you know, uh, side of it. Uh, but when you compare with, you know, no technology, you know, I mean, it's a no-brainer, you know, you, you can only always do better, you know, when you, when you adopt technology. And I think in that regard, you know, I think, you know, I know, I know uh, if what you're saying is true, uh, that they have taken on technology, I think they've done well. Uh, and certainly with regard to, you know, the adoption of technology for, for uh, publication of uh, live uh, results, I think that's a great thing. And uh, of course, I think there's a lot of room for improvement uh, from here on, but, but I, I believe, you know, it's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I agree also because this is a very important thing and there would always be growing pains. I've seen some reports here and there about um, the beavers not working, you know, maybe the fingerprint was not working, they moved to facial recognition or the internet or the INEC officials said they didn't have internet and then some people were trying to use their hotspots um, for them or just different things like that. But, you know, like you said, overall, it seems to be going fine. I think the pilots that they tried to do or the test run that they tried to do some weeks ago was really good um, for the beavers. Um, yeah, and I think that's, you know, being a developing country with a, a lot of constraints when it comes to, to, to the digital space, um, we're trying our best. It can only improve from here. And um, yeah, I think uh, generally I, I commend INEC for the efforts that they're putting into this. And we hope that as a day, I mean, we have a few more hours. Um, as the day um, develops, that um, generally the reports um, continue to be positive. Right, right. Excellent. Um, thank you so much um, um, to you both. Um, I really appreciate. Um, I think we'll be ending the session here for now. I, I'm, I'm aware that Tenny is joining us again at 9 p.m. today, where we'll have a clearer picture of things. And now we'll be you know, doing a general situation report, like how did the voting day go? I, I expect that at this point, some polling units will begin to turn in results. But again, these are not official. Uh, you can join us uh, on elections.datify.com to see the breakdown of voting as they come in in real time by local government, right? So, but then we wouldn't have a full picture yet. But I, I imagine there's there's going to be a more you know you know accessible you know level of updates, right? Um, so thank you so much to you both. I believe Dr. Chen Koladi will be joining us again tomorrow. Um, our next session is holding in like three hours time. We'll be.
having Victor Aguga. Again, we'll be discussing some of these issues and monitoring it via a special incident that we'd like to bring to your um, notice. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank, thank you for you. having me and thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Tenny and Maximus. Same. Thank you so much to the both of you. All right. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.